Uh, so this session is going to be about um, utopias, anarchy and utopias. And um, it follows on um, from last week. So here we are. Here's the order of the of the program. And um, last week, what, what I was trying to talk about was the idea of anarchy as order. And broadly, if you if you weren't here, the the argument was that anarchy is a is a form of self-government. And what I tried to to, to say was that uh, the way in which anarchists understand self-government is through a critique of, of state sovereignty. And I looked at that idea uh, both as a, a claim that um, state sovereignty is good for us because it provides enlightened rule or enlightened leadership. Um, I looked at another claim which was that uh, state sovereignty is good for us because it provides us with social peace. Um, and the third claim was that state sovereignty is beneficial because it enables us to come together and realize something called the common good or the public good. And I looked at all of those ideas and suggested that anarchists were not uh, persuaded by them uh, and that they instead, what they wanted to do was to, um, right at the end of the, of the session, we looked at a um, an idea or a diagram, a representation of an argument made by Martin Buber, which is that the, the kind of self-government that anarchists want to recommend uh, is an idea which prioritizes social relationships or you know, a different kind of, of social relationship over a political principle which is based on, on domination. Uh, and that although those things are in balance, um, the, the assertion of the social principle over the political principle enables us to think about um, diversity and plurality in, 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 our, um, in our institutional arrangements, in our governing, our self-governing arrangements, as opposed to centralization and concentration and, and hierarchy and all the things that we understand by the state. So that being the background, what I wanted to do today and and then in a slightly different way next week is to think about the ways in which anarchists have, under, have imagined this self-governing um, organization or principle. And the, the focus of the, the discussion today is on the, the ideals uh, that anarchists um, have, uh, or, or their fellow travelers in the case of William Morris, um, the ideals, the perfect kind of ideals, uh, the utopias, the models, if you like, of, um, of society that, that anarchists have painted. So in order to do that, I'm going to say something very briefly about uh, this concept of utopia as the, the beautiful idea, to, to quote Emma Goldman. And then I'm going to look at two different types of utopia. One is um, Common Sense Country, which was a, an essay written by Louisa Bevington, uh, who was um, um, rubbed shoulders, I suppose, with uh, some of the, 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 the freedom group around Kropotkin in the late 19th century. Uh, and the London anarchists. Um, and the other is, is by William Morris, who was a near contemporary, I suppose, of, um, of Louisa Bevington, um, well, actually very close contemporary of Louisa Bevington, and whose uh, final, I suppose, sort of masterpiece is sort of the book that he's most uh, celebrated for, News From Nowhere, uh, gives an impression of anarchy, um, even though, as I'll, I'll say something a, um, a bit later on about this, he wasn't himself an anarchist. So I'm going to look at those two um, ideals of, of, of anarchy, those two kinds of utopias, and then come back to, to this, this idea of the, or this, this idea of the social and the political and, and try and think about what it is that utopia um, gives us in terms of um, presenting a kind of an ima uh, anarchist imagination. So that's the, uh, that's the prospectus. 
Um, so I'm going to start off with thinking about the, the the beautiful idea. So the beautiful idea is is um, is a phrase that was used by Emma Goldman, who was a uh, um, active in America. A lot of you will have come across her. Um, she's uh, known not only for her her stringent defence of um, of anarchism as a as a political practice, um, but also for her um, her advocacy of of women's rights, um, which we'll talk about in a couple of weeks' time. And and she gives us a a definition, if you like, of anarchy, which uh, describes exactly what is desirable, what is attractive, what is it that's appealing about anarchism. And she says, anarchism then really stands for the liberation of the human mind from the domination of religion, the liberation of the human body from the domination of property, liberation from the shackles and restraint of government. Anarchism stands for a social order based on the free grouping of individuals for the purpose of producing real social wealth, an order that will guarantee to every human being free access to the earth and full enjoyment of the necessities of life according to individual desires, tastes and inclinations. So, I mean, Goldman's idea, it's, you know, it's, it's very difficult to think of, of someone who might find that unattractive as a concept. She's often painted as a, uh, an anarchist communist, but I think it's clear from, from what she has to say here that the kind of anarchist communism that she has in mind is a very libertarian kind of ideal. She wants, uh, she thinks of anarchism as being about free agreement. Uh, she thinks about anarchism as a, as a, um, a self-organizing um, society, if you like, in which individuals naturally come together uh, and enjoy um, all that life has to offer without, pretty much without um, conflict um, and for the betterment of each of them as, as individuals and collectively as a, as a, um, a collective um, organisation or, or a community, I suppose. And I think, you know, what Goldman has to say captures the essence, if you like, of, the, of this sort of utopian view of anarchism and it's utopian um not because i think it's uh necessarily impossible um but clearly because it doesn't exist so it appeals to the, the concept of utopia as no place um and also because uh you know it's not that she doesn't ever think about the problems that anarchism raises but certainly within this extract she doesn't consider any of the difficulties of, that might be associated with anarchy. What she's trying to do is to present to us a better world. Uh, and she captures the, you know, the, all of the things that are, that are good, if you like, in the promise of, of anarchy. So that's one way of thinking about the sort of the beautiful idea. The other way I've, um, I've tried to, to think about it is visually, um, and this is correctly attributed. I think the slides I sent out earlier didn't have Paul Signac on. Um, but this is, this is one of the, the famous visual images of, of, of the utopian um, idea of anarchy as the beautiful idea. It's called in the time of harmony. And you can see um, it's uh, a, a, one of the themes that comes up again and again in, in uh, William Morris's work. This is a, a place of, of leisure, a place of rest, a place of um, beauty. Um, a place of harmony uh, where people are uh, fulfilling their individual uh, inclinations and desires, be it reading or art or dancing or um, whatever it is they have. They can pick the fruit from food from the trees. It's a, it looks like a kind of a land of cocaine um, and, and people are engaged in, in play, essentially. Um, and it's it's the promise of a better world. It, it contrasts with everything that we know um, about capitalism as a place which regulates our work, which, uh, which is exploitative, which is alienating, which uh, divides people from each other, which uh, creates suspicions and uh, distrust, um, and where people uh, think of leisure as, as something that they might uh, have, you know, maybe one day a week uh, when the work uh, stops and if they have enough money to, to keep themselves together, uh, that they can, they can find something else to do apart from labour for somebody else's benefit. So this is the sort of the visual uh, image of the, of the beautiful idea. So how does this play out in, uh, in literature? So what I'm going to do is to talk a little bit first about uh, Louisa Bevington, and then I'm going to talk about Morris. 
Uh, and then, as I say, I'm going to come back to this uh, this uh, discussion about what what how utopia relates to to a concept of, of self government. So to start off with uh, Louisa Bevington. So some of you might not have uh, come across Louisa Bevington. She was a um, initially a poet as well as a propagandist. Um, she came into uh, prominence, I suppose, partly through the encouragement that she'd received from Herbert Spencer. And Spencer was a, a noted um, sort of anti-state libertarian, I guess, or liberal. He's someone who Kropotkin engaged, engaged with uh, at some length um, because he uh, positioned himself as, a, as an anti-socialist, meaning someone who didn't like the idea of socialism because for him it spelt uh, a very controlling kind of government. And what Spencer wanted was a, uh, a self-organizing society, but one which wasn't anarchist in the sense that it allowed domination through the, the operation of, of market relations. Uh, but he's an interesting guy because he does talk about, um, he does have sort of some principles which he shares with, with anarchists about the, the domination of the state, even though he can't see uh, the ways in which capitalism is also uh, itself problematic. Anyway, she gravitated um, as a poet to, towards anarchist communism. She was a contributor to a number of the, the uh, leading uh, anarchist journals uh, in, in London, including The Torch. That was the, the, the journal that was set up by uh, the Rossetti sisters. Uh, so these were the, the nieces of, of Dante Gabriel Rossetti. Uh, and also to um, a paper called Liberty. Uh, she uh, contributed uh, a, a, quite a well-known essay to, to Liberty, which is called uh, why, I'm an, why I Am an Expropriationist. Uh, so why she was, I mean, I suppose we would say anti-capitalist these days. She was a, a, an author of the, uh, the Anarchist Communist Manifesto. She also wrote quite um, widely about anarchism and violence as someone who wasn't going to... Um, Toe the line, I suppose, in terms of the, the familiar critiques of the anarchists as, as terrorists and bombers. And, and her argument about violence was that um, actually it was, although anarchism itself was a, um, a set, it described a politics, it wasn't a, it didn't describe a, any particular kinds of actions. Uh, she defended the actions of those who fought um, violently for justice and distinguished those people from, from those that she considered to be sensationalists, i.e. people who were just interested in, in committing sort of very transgressive deeds. Um, and she refused to condemn um, anarchists for uh, the violence they undertook as part of a, a campaign for justice. And she, she defended them against what she considered to be the hypocrisy of the, of the mainstream media. So she was quite a controversial figure. Um, to give a flavour of, of her poetry, of her work, of where she was sort of, how she, how she presented herself as a, as a thinker, if you like, through her poetry. I've got a couple of um, extracts from two poems that she wrote. I mean, her, her poetry is quite, um, not that I'm a, in any way a, a sort of a literary critic at all, but um, her poetry is quite diverse, but quite a lot of it falls into one of two camps. Some of it is, is very much like this poem, very much focused on um, issues of, of domination and, uh, and abuse. And, and other poems are focused very much on uh, questions of trans transformation and, and revolutionary change. Um, and these are short extracts, which I'll, I'll read out and I'll try not to, to do too much violence to. Um, and this is an extract from a poem called One More Bruised Heart. Uh, and she writes, one more bruised heart laid bare, one victim more, one more wail heard. Oh, is there never end of all these passionate agonies that rend young hopes to tatters through enslavement sore. So long, pale child, your patient spirit bore its wrong in secret, ere you sought a friend. And yet what love of mine can ever mend again for you the veil your tyrant tore. Oh, there are woes too bitter to be shown, Oh, there are tears too burning to be seen, yet purest sympathy, select and clean, may feel the agony its very own. Sweet slave child, whom your voiceless griefs oppress, I cannot cure, I may in part express. 
So this is often described as a as a poem about child abuse. I think it's um, for me it's a, a poem about predatory behaviours uh, and the um, the uh, the vulnerabilities of 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 people in um, in in their social relationships under under capitalism and and in in, in conditions of, of exploitation. Uh, and and there's a, a number of, of poems that she writes along those lines. So to to, to look at the, the sort of the transformative um, poems, I mean, this one is about um, revolution disappointed, I think, and um, and yet revolution also as a as a possibility for for the future. Uh, and the image I've chosen here is is taken from the uh, the Luddite. Um, uh, museum in, in Nottingham. And this is called Bought with a Price. I a price, what price? Ye saved ones of these later ages, ye few who have learnt to be free and have true things to tell. The price of the past generations of blind men and sages who lived for you, died for you, suffered and went down to hell and never came back. Savage sinners, the conquered despised. Crude spokesmen of chaos they sprang from, all lusty with due time. Then singly, messiahs, blood sweating for order and beauty, in their day all failures, all martyrs for us of the new time. I bought with a price, my sisters and brothers, this moment we live and know how and know why and have nothing to fear. We are debtors, dear comrades. Oh, think of the Calvaries suffered, hands round, true to trust, millennium is bound to appear. Tis our generation must fight the last fight against warfare, must hurl the good mammon in depths of oblivion sea, unmask and drive from us all tyrannous powers of darkness and make the sweet planet a home of humanity free. So the reason I chose this is, is because it, it, it gives you the sort of the, um, the hope, if you like, against the uh, the the critique of the of the um, of the other poem, and I think it's that that kind of balance, if you like, uh, or this that that contrast, I should say, not balance, that contrast uh, that comes through that that structures her utopia, uh, which is called common sense country. So Common Sense Country is a, is a short essay um, and it's packed uh, with ideas. I mean, it's, it's virtually every line is, is it's incredibly quotable. Every line gives you a, uh, a different perspective or a new perspective on, on how things could be improved, how things could change for the better. And it's written from the point of view of utopia achieved. So this is written from the perspective of being in common sense country and looking back, if you like, at the uh, at what common sense country has destroyed in terms of nonsensical uh, existing realities. Um, and there are a number of, 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 of themes in it, I think, um, not just, you know, all of which um, illustrate the difference between what, what could be and what exists. Um, and as a communist, I mean, the, one of the key themes that she keeps coming back to in Common Sense Country is this idea of property and property having been abolished. Um, and, and one of the ways that she expresses this in Common Sense Country is to, to think of how um, goods that are produced in common sense conditions uh, think about themselves, if you like, as, as commodities. Um, in compared to, to to capitalist society, how they how they think of themselves as having new life in common sense country. So she says, property. Um, I was needed. I was made. I was conveyed. I was applied. I was consumed. So in common sense country, people are making things because they have uh, value in themselves. They have purpose. They have function, um, and they're they're cherished. Uh, whereas in a nonsensical country, I was coveted, I was done without, I was lied for, I was hated for, I was speculated in, I was adulterated, I was advertised, I was legislated about, I was sold and my buyer with me, I was squandered, I was hoarded, I was quarrelled over, I was fought for, I was burgled, 
I was Bond. So the 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 idea that she's trying to communicate is is one of um, production for profit, um, uh, which involves all kinds of enmities and uh, rivalries and conflict and hardship and pain, uh, and a world. Again, this is a theme that comes out very strongly in Morris too, a world in which we produce things because we want to produce things and we have uh, a use for them and we do it in ways which uh, don't cause people harm uh, and, and which also don't cause our environments harm. Um, to another of the, the themes that she, that she pursues in Utopia, um, and this is a sort of, a, it's a very visual theme, um, and it's about the aesthetics of utopia. So utopia, uh, the anarchist utopia, common sense country, it's a beautiful place. It's a place you'd want to be in because it, it's just, a, it's lovely to look at. It makes you feel good. So she says, in common sense country, there were no jerry built houses because people could not see any reason for making insecure and unhealthy dwellings. Jerry building is again is a theme that comes up in, in Morris's work as a um, you know the, sort of the ruination of London is the, the construction of, of of all of these houses that now go for for, for tens of thousands millions of pounds um, as as you know desirable Victorian properties um, for for people like uh, Louisa Bevington these were these were Jerry built. Uh, she says no builder or mason moreover had in the name of common sense any object whatever in view so immediately as the supplying of buildings wanted for use um, so in common sense country people live in places that are uh, comfortable that are clean that are sanitary uh, th that uh, and meet the needs of the people who who need to to have shelter so this is a uh, a world where not only is, is communism a, uh, meeting a basic minimum, it's meeting it in, in ways which are inherently desirable. Um, finally, the, there's a, the, the, one of the, the big contrasts that she wants to bring out uh, is between the, the, the kinds of uh, norms and, and practices that we have in, 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 in our current society and nonsensical society compared to, to those that uh, that exist in in common sense country, and and here what you find is it's the absence that that does the that does the work. It's what doesn't exist in common sense country, and which does exist in in nonsensical uh, land, uh, which which brings out the the desirability of common sense country. So she says, common sense citizens never said time is money. No one said money is power. Sometimes it was said money is weakness. So this is a complete reversal of the. Uh, of of the the sort of the social logics of, of of capitalism, and along with the uh, the destruction of capitalism, of course, you get the destruction of the state institutions which are integral to them. So she says, in common sense country, there were no arsenals, no armies, no police, no spies, no banks, no prisons, no poorhouses, no brothels, no divorce courts, no nunneries, no confessionals, no rings, no strikes, no infernal machines. Uh, no gallows. Uh, so this is a world uh, which does not need all of those instruments of force and discipline uh, that we're told are, are required for our security and, and uh, peaceful coexistence. Uh, common sense country has, has done away with those. And this is, a, this is, I think, a really key aspect of, of what um, Bevington's utopia is all about, uh, because common sense country as a uh, as a form of self government is a land of harmony, um, and this is what she has to say about it. There was no schism in that country, so we ha we have no class war, we have no uh, social divisions, um, uh, and we have no um, ideological rivalries. There's no schism because there was no church. There was a great deal of religion because common senseites had time to try their best powers of life and mind on everything. And the more they knew the deeper depths of sheer wonderfulness did they find beneath the new one knowledge. They found that life, love, liberty, peace, progress, and everything worth having came as the reward of adherence to certain inexorable universal laws inherent in everything. 
laws in which there was no variableness, no shadow of turning, and also no respect of persons. They had the interest and zest in getting hold of these laws and falling in with them as fast as they became visible, and they never dreamt of making cheap and nasty substitutes for laws in places of cases where none appeared of their own accord. Um, I think somebody said last last week that um, some of the things I was saying about anarchism and self-government sounded a bit like natural law. I mean, there's absolutely no question in in Bevington's description of, of common sense country that what she's talking about is the restoration of a set of um, processes and practices and um, principles, if you like, that we've forgotten. Uh, this is the return to nature, uh, a return to a um, a self-regulating world which enables us to come together without any kind of social divisions and that's what she means by um, by a, a land of, of harmony okay so um, I think it contrasts actually to the ways in which other anarchists um, we might see some of this next week uh, talked about harmony as uh, as a principle of self-organization uh, so one of the things that Kropotkin used to say, for example, quoting Fourier, the, the utopian socialist, was, you know, um, put stones in a box and shake them and they'll organize themselves. And he also used the analogy of, of um, uh, atomic physics to think about the ways in which uh, individuals harmonized into greater wholes without any kind of, 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 of external action. But what we have here in Bevington, I think, is a slightly different kind of, of idea of harmony. This is an idea of peace and love. Um, this is an idea of, uh, of, of genuine faith, uh, which, again, we talked about a little bit last week, restored. Uh, and the disorder uh, that comes from the imposition of, of, of rules and regulations from outside here, specifically through the church, all of that has been... Uh, abandoned, and because that, because of that abandonment, we're in a, we're allowed to uh, to realise ourselves as in our natural kind of harmonious condition, uh, and that I think is is one of the key um, themes that comes across in 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 these anarchist utopias. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say about um, Bevington. I'm going to move on um, now to talk a little bit about William Morris. Um, so um, William Morris, is, um, William Morris's dates are, um, he lived slightly longer than Bevington. He was born in 1834 and died in 1896. So she died a year um, beforehand. Um, and Morris was, I mean, like Bevington, he was, he was known um, principally um, in, his, in his youth as a, as a poet and then um, later a designer. Uh, when he set up what was called the firm, he started uh, producing furniture and um, designing wallpapers and 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 all of that. Um, he became a socialist. He, I mean, he says in the in the the late eighteen seventies that he 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 would join the first socialist party that that was formed in in Britain, and he did. Uh, and he became a socialist as as soon as socialism um, became organised in the eighteen eighties. Uh, he fell out. I mean, he joined the Social Democratic Federation. Um, which I suppose became the uh, the flag bearer of, of Marxism in, in Britain, or Marxist social democracy. Um, he fell out with its leader, H.M. Heinemann, uh, and then set up his own group. Um, and he ran the paper, which was called the Socialist League. Um, he produced a paper called Commonweal. Uh, he, and the, the Socialist League was, was hit by various factions. So in the, the 1880s, Five, six, seven. There were divisions uh, between some of its leading members um, about the direction of the party, and, and particularly about the, um, the 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 policy of, of of entering into parliamentary politics, which Morris was opposed to. And uh, the party split, um, and that split left Morris uh, with a, a group of people who considered themselves to be anarchists, attracted to Morris because he had rejected parliamentary politics. As time went on towards the 1890s, uh, Morris fell out with the anarchists because he thought that they had nothing to offer and that they were falling into, um, into violence, into the advocacy of violence. And although he was an anti-parliamentarian, he never considered himself to be an anarchist. Um, but it was at this point where he falls out with the anarchists in the Socialist League. 
uh, that he writes News from Nowhere. And News from Nowhere is actually uh, the, the, the very opening sort of page of News from Nowhere starts with a, um, a discussion he's, he has up the league with the anarchists about the nature of future society. And although, um, as I say, Morris did not call himself an anarchist, uh, the book that he produced uh, was regarded by anarchists as a as a, a perfect anarchy, if you like. This was this this was an anarchist utopia. And when Morris died, um, Kropotkin uh, wrote an obituary for him in Freedom, uh, where he describes it in the following terms. He said, when he undertook to write his own romance of the future, news from nowhere, he, i.e., Morris produced perhaps the most thoroughly and deeply anarchistic conception of future society that has ever been written. His ideal society is the one most imbued with the feelings of equality and human, humanitarian love, the most spontaneously glowing out of a spirit of free understanding. So uh, this is a, a picture of, of the future, which is, um, for an anarchist, it, it looks like a kind of an anarchist, a, a, an anarchy, a utopian anarchy. So um, just to, to give you some context, if you haven't read um, News from Nowhere, News from Nowhere is, is, is sort of looks to the future. So um, having sort of set the scene about this argument that, that Morris has with the anarchists up the league, um, you're then introduced to, to a dream. Um, and uh, Morris's alter ego called Guest in the book uh, wakes up uh, in this transformed world it's and it's london transformed uh and the story of the book is that um guest travels through nowhere from london to oxfordshire um and he um he describes if you like the uh the world and the people that he encounters and and this world is a uh as we'll see it's a it, it's it's a communist world it has no government it's uh, it's a self-regulating society. I think one of the things I wanted to say about um, News from Nowhere before we get on to the sort of the, uh, some of the features of it is that um, the idea of London transformed um, and the sort of the utopian picture, which is deeply anti-industrial, uh, that kind of picture of London is something that he, he first thinks about actually in, in some of his early poetry, particularly in The Earthly Paradise, which he writes between 1868 and 71-ish. Um, and one of the stanzas in, in The Earthly Paradise, uh, which I'll read here, is he says, forget six counties overhung with smoke, forget the snorting steam and piston stroke, Forget the spreading of the hideous town. Think rather of the pack horse on the down and dream of London, small and white and clean, the clear Thames bordered by its gardens green. And a lot of this kind of imagery comes back in News from Nowhere. So right at the beginning of the book, uh, when Guest wakes up and he you know, he's gone to sleep in Hammersmith the night before, uh, and he's and he's looked across at, at, at Hammersmith Bridge, which Morris himself cons considered to be one of the ugliest uh, innovations in London. Um, and he wakes up and he sees the world. He sees London completely changed. And he says, is this the Thames? But I held my peace in my wonder and turned my bewildered eyes eastward to look at the bridge again and thence to the shores of the London River. And surely there was enough to astonish me. For though there was a bridge across the steam and the houses on its banks, how all was changed from last night. The soap works and their smoke vomiting chimneys were gone. The engineers works gone. The lead works gone. And no sound of riveting and hammering came down the west wind. Then the bridge. I had perhaps dreamed of such a bridge, but never seen such an one out of an illuminated manuscript. It was of stone arches, splendidly solid and as graceful as they were strong, high enough also to let booths or shops or ordinary river traffic through easily. Over the parapet showed quaint and fanciful little buildings, which I supposed to be booths or shops, beset with painted and gilded veins and spirillettes. The stone was a little weathered, but showed no marks of the grimy sootiness which I was used to on every London building more than a year old. So again, this is a world which is immediately uh, deindustrialized. It's clean. It's beautiful, uh, and it, and for Morris, it resonates with 
uh, what he considers to be, you know, the, the standard, if you like, of, of, of beauty. It, it looks like a, a, a medieval world. Uh, it looks, it, that's what it reminds him of. So, um, as I say, the, 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 the story itself um, uh, takes guest uh, from the Thames through to uh, what he calls the place of rest. Um, and this is um, a house. Uh, which is based on uh, his own home that he had in Oxfordshire called Pelmscott Manor. Um, and it's, um, I suppose, distinguished. I mean, the, the aesthetics of nowhere are distinguished um, by all of the things that Morris himself loved. Uh, simplicity, um, the ability to uh, construct your environments um, in character, that is by using the local resources so that things, the world looks different. The world doesn't look like the globalized world that we know, where you can find the same buildings from, you know, America on every continent in the world. You know that you're in somewhere where different because the buildings have been constructed from local stones and uh, the furniture has been, or the, all the interiors have been constructed uh, by local craftspeople. So um, the, he says, you know, everywhere there was but little furniture. This is in, in Kelmscott House or the, the place of rest, the resting place, little furniture, and that only the most necessary and of the simplest forms. The extravagant love of ornament, which I had noted in this people elsewhere, seemed here to have given place to the feeling that the house itself and its associations was the ornament of the country at life amidst which it had been left stranded from old times. So, I mean, there's there's quite a lot here that I think resonates with Bevington in terms of um, building from a sense of of, uh, of of love, of worth, of 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 wanting to to find use and purpose in in the things that we uh, in 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 our environments and the things that we use. So um, why is this an anarchy? Um, or why is it considered to be an anarchy? Uh, just like Bevington. Uh, the, the 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 place nowhere that, that Morris describes is a place where where there's no private property anymore. Uh, so things are held in common, things are held in trust. People uh, just use what they need, uh, and they uh, they produce what they what they want to produce. They're they're driven by their own desires and um, uh, talents, if you like. Um, they live in, uh, they have uh, family groups, but these are not uh, regulated by any kinds of uh, uh, permanent law, if you like. So he, it's, a, it's a world of free love to a, to, to a degree, I suppose. So people tend to enter into monogamous relationships, but these don't bind them uh, in any permanent way. So if a relationship um, fails, then people can uh, separate amicably. Uh, there's no formal marriage. Children are looked after by the community if they're not looked after by their parents. Um, and people think of, 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 of uh, romantic relationships as, as uh, you know, um, uh, without judgment. Uh, I think that's, that's the point. Uh, there's no formal schooling. So children are encouraged to, uh, to just follow their predispositions. Uh, they have access to, to, um, to literature if they want it. Um, he says, actually, at one point that it's a world where you don't have many books. Uh, sorry, Ross. Um, but, you know, uh, it's a world where, where people learn actually largely through their engagements with each other. Uh, it's a world where there's no government. So there's no police. There's no military. There's no formal justice system. Uh, there are disputes. Um, and when, when there are disputes, these are um, these are not, there's no vengeance. Uh, people don't seek to, to, to extract penalty from each other. It's a world which is internationalist. So he thinks of, I mean, he thinks of, or he talks at one point about the, the United Kingdom has broken down into its, into its national areas where people speak their own languages, uh, and they are able to communicate by learning each other's languages as opposed to speaking in English. Uh, it's a world which doesn't understand patriotism, um, or certainly not nationalism either. It, it operates on the basis of gift economy. So one of the things that Guests finds out as soon as he he, he starts to, to move around in nowhere is that 
Uh, he meets this, this character called Dick, who just gives him a pipe and tobacco. Uh, he tries to, to think about how he can pay him back. And Dick is, you know, just astonished that anybody would want to do that. Everything works on the basis of, um, of gift giving. And uh, all of the, the labour is voluntary. So no one is compelled to work. And I'll say a bit more about that in a couple of slides. Uh, this, is, this is a really crucial thing for Morris, that, that, that labour itself has been uh, released from the shackles of, of, um, of compulsion. One of the things that's quite controversial about Morris's description of nowhere is that on a couple of occasions, uh, he tends to talk in... Um, I suppose quite disparaging terms, or what might be regarded as disparaging terms, about the, uh, the 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 fondness that young women have to serve uh, their menfolk, um, and this has sort of led to the accusation, I suppose, that that Morris is a uh, quite conservative in his understanding of uh, of women. Um, yet at the same time, one of the the central characters in Nowhere is a woman called Ellen, who he meets. Um, later on in the in the book in the story um, and he confesses to, to one of his socialist comrades that uh, or one of his socialist comrades says to him because you know I'm I'm in love with Ellen and Morris says well isn't everybody and Ellen is this very um, independently independent minded uh, self-willed woman um, and at one point in the book I think to underpin the extent to which social relationships, you know, intimate romantic relationships have changed and, and women's position has also changed uh, through the revolution, through, through the, uh, the construction of nowhere, uh, is a passage that where, where Ellen reflects on what would have been of her life had she been, um, had she been brought up 100 years earlier in Victorian Britain. And she says, you wondered what I should have been if I had lived in those past days of turmoil and oppression. I should have been one of the poor. My beauty and cleverness and brightness would have been sold to rich men and my life would have been wasted indeed. For, no, for I know enough of that to know that I should have had no choice, no power of will over my life, and that I should never have bought pleasure from rich men or even opportunity of action whereby I might have won some true excitement. I should have been wrecked and wasted in one way or another, either by penury or luxury. Um, so the possibilities that women have to realise themselves as independent, as self-governing, uh, self-willed individuals uh, exists in nowhere in a way that it had never existed, um, as Morris understood it, in his own uh, Victorian times. So this is indeed a world transformed. The second, um, I think, really important aspect, I and mean, this is the, for Morris, I think this is the key aspect, actually, I think, of, of the utopia that he, he wants to describe. And, and, and although he describes it in utopian terms in News From Nowhere, it's actually a principle that he's absolutely committed to in his socialism as being utterly realistic and, and utterly necessary. Uh, Morris's argument with with, with all socialists, all of his contemporaries, was that um, if socialism was only about uh, abandoning class oppression, then we wouldn't really have achieved uh, as much as we should have done. The only way we were only going, the only way we were going to realise socialism was through the transformation of labour, and specifically by the um, the re um, the reinvention of of labour through art. So Morris's argument was that socialism was the world in which everything becomes pleasurable because it's art. Everything that people produce, everything that people do, they do as artists, as craftspeople. Uh, that is, they invest their, uh, their energies, their passions, their creativity. Uh, and because they do this and in, they invest all of this in, their, in, their, um, in the things that they produce, when they exchange things through gifts, of course, this in, proves dramatically the kind of the, 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 the quality of our lives. Uh, everything becomes an act of love, an act of beauty. And he says, so one, the, this is the thing that distinguishes nowhere from, from uh, as a, for, for Morris, as a, um, as a socialist utopia. All work is now pleasurable, either because of the hope of gain in honour and wealth with, with which the work is done, which causes pleasurable excitement, even when the actual work is not pleasant, or else because it has grown into a pleasurable habit, as in the case of what you might call mechanical work. And lastly, 
And most of our work of, is of this kind because there is conscious, sensuous pleasure in the work itself. It is done, that is, by artists. I see, said I, this is guest. Can you now tell me how you've come to this happy condition? For to speak plainly, this change from the conditions of the old world seems to me to be far greater and more important than all the other changes you have told me about as to crime, politics, property, marriage. Uh, and his guide says, you're right there, said he. Indeed, you may say rather that it is this change which makes all the others possible. What is the object of revolution? Surely to make people happy and happiness without happy, happily, happy daily work is impossible. So we have the, the transformation of labor through art. And this is why um, um, nowhere is a, is a place of, of contentment. And just as Louisa Bevington argues, it's also a place of harmony. He calls it an epoch of rest. Um, and it's a place where um, there are no lasting social divisions. So at one point, Morris does talk about uh, a triangular relationship uh, that goes wrong and that, which ends ends in a uh, which ends in violence, in fact. But these are transitory problems, and day to day relationships are peaceful and self regulating and harmonious. Um, so he says, we do not deceive ourselves, indeed, or believe that we can get rid of all the trouble that besets the dealings between the sexes. I.e., there's always hardship. There's always um, broken hearts that come from love uh, and there's always uh, conflict that's possible through love yet uh, we don't have the kinds of uh, divisive relationships that we see in capitalist society and that's not just because we've got rid of class it's also because as Morris says we've got rid of politics so guest Morris's alter ego says how do you manage with politics his, his, his guide, Hammond, says, smiling, we are very well off as to politics because we have none. <laughs> there are no political disputes. Um, and that, if you like, is, is the, um, I suppose, the equivalent uh, of what Louisa Bevington uh, wants to say about the kind of the peace and love of, of common sense country. Uh, this is also a place where uh, the the things that, that, that normally divide us that we think are, are sort of, you know, super important uh, and which, which put us on opposite sides of arguments, all of that is gone. Uh, there is just understanding uh, and a, an ability to overcome any kind of, of, of division or dispute. Uh, Morris doesn't see any of this. Uh, the, the, the closest he comes to it is, uh, is, 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 is about uh, voluntary labour and in fact, that's also uh, resolved. So they're the, the, the two um, sort of models of utopia uh, that I wanted to, to uh, describe, I guess, as, as descriptions of, of perfect anarchies. And just to, to round off, I wanted to, to come back to the, um, to the, idea of, of, of self-government that, that, that I looked at last week through, through um, the lens of Martin Buber uh, and his essays, State and Society. And just to recap, I mean, one of the things that, that Buber wants to say about um, society and the state is that they're both kind of conflicted conditions. Uh, so one never eradicates the other. Even in the in, even where we have very uh, highly regulated, highly centralised states which concentrate power, have clearly you know uh, hard territorial borders and and clear jurisdictions and all of that, all of those things that we we know about states. Even in in where those arrangements dominate, there's there's still something called society that that exists in in the same spaces. And which also transgresses those spaces, or, or um, yeah. Um, and in the same way, uh, when he talks about there being two principles of organisation or, or, or um, association, uh, he says there's a political principle which tends to point towards um, uh, the exercise of power, the the organisation of of authority, and the experience of domination. And he compares that to a social principle uh, where those uh, 
um, those those practices are are reduced. Okay, uh, so how does utopia fit in into that kind of um, model? And I think one of the things that that Bevington and and Morris are giving us is is a an anarchy, a utopian picture, uh, which in which actually this this complexity is lost. So there is no state, and in Morris it's quite explicit, there is no politics either. Um, what we have is a is a, a society reborn, it's a complete mirror image of it, um, and a social principle of association that dominates in it. Uh, and there is no uh, there is no domination, there is no authority, there is no no leadership. Uh, people live in this this natural order uh, in, in which which is regulated by um, by respect and mutuality and cooperation and and love. So there's a and and I think there's a the the, the risk, if you like, of this utopia, this kind of uh, description of utopia, is that it it risks losing what Buber sees as the sort of the, the, the very virtue of of society, which is which is its complexity and its plurality and its um, multiplicity. What you have in these utopias is something which is is actually quite uniform. Um, people are pretty much the same. They think the same things. They they have the same kinds of perspectives on on the world, and their institutions are self regulating because they see the world in the same ways. So um, utopia doesn't sit well with the kind of uh, idea of, of anarchy as a self-governing society, which is resisting, but still open to a political principle and which resists the state, um, but which is also um, conscious of the, of the possibility of domination uh, as, a, 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 as a reality. So what's the value then of, of, of thinking about utopias? And I'm sort of, I suppose I'm sort of laboring the point a bit because there is an argument to say that actually anarchists and, and socialists more generally should be very wary of utopian thought because it does impose this, or it does sort of suggest this uniformity, which is not only impractical, um, but also quite unattractive. Um, but I think, you know, that, that critique of utopia sort of misses the point of, of the, um, of the work that Bevington and, and Morris were, were undertaking. And I think what they were trying to do uh, in these um, ideal societies, in these images of, of possible futures, was really just to think about what's desirable uh, and to, to, to just put on the table the possibility that we could order the world in a different way. So in a sense, the way I read these utopias is as a, not just as an exercise in the imagination, which I think is, which is always valuable, um, but actually also um, in, in our contemporary terms to, to reject the idea that there is no alternative. There are always possible worlds. And the great thing about these utopias is that they, um, they're designed, I suppose, to stimulate our imaginations to think about what it is that we would want in terms of our institutions, in terms of our arrangements, in terms of our, our environmental conditions, uh, in terms of ways in which we want to, to relate to each other. So from that point of view, I think uh, it's, it's, it's easy to, to knock spots off utopias, um, but actually they serve a, a really, really important purpose. Okay, well, I think I'll leave it there. I've got just at the end of the slide, just to show you, um, I've, I've put down a, a list of all of the readings that, um, that I've used if you want to, to, to go away and, and look at the full texts later.